This is Normal. I'm your host, Emily, and my co-host, Sarah, and we have Michael Federasi, our uh, adult entertainment lawyer, um, with us today. And so we, this, we're going to interview you, and your um, Twitter is at PornLaw, correct? At PornLaw. Mm -hmm. And uh, then what is your website from there? Adult, adult Biz Law. Adult Biz Law. Yeah. Porn law was already taken by a guy in Germany, so oh. I had to go with adult biz law. <laughs> well, it's, uh, you know, isn't that what happens? Yes. Yeah. That's I don't know happens. why the guy in Germany has porn law. <laughs> <laughs> it really bothered me, but it does. But you were, I, I was going to say, so let's talk a little bit about what being an adult entertainment lawyer is and is not. So well, what it was not was was kind of the easier list. Well, yeah, I, I don't as as an adult entertainment attorney, I there's a lot of different things that I cover: um, copyright, mm -hmm. trademark, intellectual property issues, mm -hmm. criminal. I've got to deal with criminal statutes, mm -hmm. uh, zoning statutes. I've got to deal with um, regular entertainment issues such as entity formation, contracts, model releases. Then I've got to deal with federal statutes like 18 U.S.C. 2257. I have to deal with obscenity issues once in a while. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very broad-based type of practice, mm -hmm. and it goes amongst many different practices. I deal with employment law and workers' compensation as well. Mm -hmm. So anything, anything that a business attorney would handle, mm -hmm. and anything that an entertainment attorney would handle, and then anything that sort of a criminal attorney would handle, is sort of what an adult entertainment attorney is. Okay. And so what I don't really do is um, real estate law. Mm -hmm. I don't really do wills and trusts. Mm -hmm. And I touch on First Amendment, but I would never dare call myself a First Amendment attorney. I've got an idea and a grasp of First Amendment, but I would never say that I'm a First Amendment attorney. So while we were off air, you were talking a little bit about how you got into this. And I'm, love, I'm, I'm loving hearing about this. So, the politics part? Yes, or the I want to hear more about how you went from graduating college and got to where you're at now. Uh, people say I should write a book. But I, <laughs> I forget stuff too. <laughs> so you went out for school board. Uh, back in my little hometown mm -hmm. in New Jersey, I ran. I got out of college and I moved back home and I ran for school board. Mm -hmm. And there were three seats available. Nine people were running for the school board and I finished fourth. I just missed a seat by a couple hundred votes. The guy that I ran on a ballot with, he won, he got on the school board. But then that night we were out, and in New Jersey, if, if you guys are from the East Coast, mm -hmm. which I know you are, mm -hmm. diners are a big thing. Yeah. Yes. We're at the Rio Diner in Woodbridge, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and the mayor of the town walks into the, to the mm -hmm. diner, and he comes up to me and says, you know, he was impressed. I had never met him before, but he said he was impressed with how well I did at being 22 and running for school board, the youngest guy ever in Woodbridge to run for school board. And then he invited me to join a couple civic uh, mm -hmm. committees that he was heading. So I kind of got to sit next to him and work alongside the mayor of Woodbridge, which kind of gave me the mayor's ear. And in a small town, when you have the mayor's ear, you kind of become somewhat of an important person. Yeah, I mean, it's not big issues when you're talking about small town. I mean, I remember a guy called me because he was complaining that his neighbor was working on his truck and his truck was up on cinder blocks and the tires were off of it and it was creating an ugly look at <laughs> I mean, these are the kind of things right. we deal with. It's very in the small town. It's very, not Los very Angeles. Right. So it was, to him it was important. So I, you know, I was able to talk to the mayor who was able to send somebody down and make the guy put tires back on the truck and make <laughs> it look pretty. So it kind of gave me a little bit of, you know, cachet around town. Mm -hmm. um, and then what was interesting is, is that he ran for and, and I also helped run campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, I ran campaigns about a councilman that wow. were running for stuff. So I was kind of being groomed to run myself again for higher office. He ended up running for and becoming governor of New Jersey. Huh. Ah. You may have heard of him. His name was James McGreevy. Mm -hmm. okay. James McGreevy was um, the governor of New Jersey that came out and said, I'm a gay American. Mm -hmm. And he quit being governor of New Jersey because he had the affair with the Israeli guy that he put onto the the security. Yes. Yeah. That was James McGreevy. And that was the Mayor of Virginia. That's how I met him and we worked together. And literally, what I was supposed to do was go home. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, he wanted me to stay in New Jersey to go to law school so I could work with him on different campaigns. And I said, no, I, I need to get out of here for a while. I need to go to California and 
you know, enjoy not being in New Jersey. Mm-hmm, sure. If you know anything about New Jersey, yeah, you got to get out once you, in a you while. Just, <laughs> it's good to go to California. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if anybody's watching this, if you're from New Jersey, I'm really sorry, <laughs> but it's like quicksand. But it's true. It's yeah. like, yeah. The, I, yeah. It, Maryland's the same way. Uh-huh. It, it, it may They're, be the East Coast. It I, like, you stay it there, quicksand. and it's and, quicksand. And you yeah. don't grow. You don't leave. Yeah. yeah, you don't leave. So. I came out here with the intent of going to law school and graduating and mm-hmm. then going back home because they were kind of grooming me to run for state assembly and then state senate mm-hmm. and possibly congress. And I met my ex-wife, fell in love. She was in the garment business, so we were supposed to move back to New Jersey so she could work in New York oh. and be in the garment business in New York. Mm-hmm. And then that all... Not so much. Not so much. Yeah. <laughs> so after six years and graduating law school and working, you know, all of that went away and I ended up becoming an attorney. So how did you decide this was the law that you wanted to get into? You know, it's funny. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've got the list, you know, you've got the options you such in a front list of you. Available to, yeah. How does uh, this come to pass? Yeah. From a personal standpoint, um, even when I was in high school, I liked the slutty girls. Okay? Mm-hmm. I... We like slutty girls. Mm-hmm. I was I was a quarterback on my football team. I played football, basketball, and all the guys in my high school would date the cheerleaders and the nice girls. And I was always the guy that was dating the slutty girls from the other high schools. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And on Fridays and Saturday nights, they were hanging out, and I was going out and getting laid. And then I ended up working as a DJ in a strip bar mm-hmm. because my parents owned a business down the Jersey Shore. He knew people, so. I started working as a DJ in a shirt bar. And then I started bartending and I started teaching bartending and mm-hmm. I started dating a lot of girls mm-hmm. that worked in strip clubs. So I was always kind of into the slutty girls and I was more into the sex industry, mm-hmm. even back then working mm-hmm. in strip bars. But then, I, and, and before going to law school, I lived with a stripper for three years mm-hmm. and then ended up going to law school. And decided that it wasn't probably a smart idea for me to take my stripper girlfriend to California with me to, you know, work while I was in law school. I decided I needed to grow up and I needed to be a lawyer. And mm-hmm. Plus, there's plenty of strippers out here. Right. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I was really at a point in my life where I was like, I need to grow up. I need, mm-hmm. I need to find the right girl. I need uh-huh. to find, like, the marriage girl. Mm-hmm. And that's what I ended up doing. And then I realized I was, was not the life for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was didn't not work. a country club. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was not a country club playing attorney. No croquet. No. <laughs> the, you know, the, the typical things that lawyers are like, I didn't like to do. Right. And after being with her for 10 years and being married for seven, I realized that I wasn't the right guy for her mm-hmm. and decided she probably could be better mm-hmm. and find that right type of guy for mm-hmm. her. And we ended up getting divorced. And when I got to law school, I dated a girl in law school by, um, her grandfather was a man by the name of Milton Morris. Never, never heard of him, right? Mm-mm. Never heard of him. Danny, you ever hear of him? No, nope. nope. doesn't ring a bell. You should Google, if you're at home, Google mm-hmm. Milton, M-I-L-T-O-N-L-U-R-O-S. Okay. okay. Milton Morris founded the porn industry in the San Fernando Valley. Okay. You should know his name. You should know his name. Right. Because without him, none of us would be where we are right now. He came out here in 1955 or something like that, mm-hmm. before the, there was an industry, and he was backed by the mob. And sure. he bought a, they bought a nudist colony in San Diego. And they would take pictures at the nudist colony and sell it as a lifestyle magazine before you could even think about doing porn, okay? So it was pictures of naked girls. It's funny, it's not only naked, it's, only, it's not only naked pictures of girls, but there's naked pictures of girls, naked pictures of guys, and naked pictures of children in these magazines. Yes, I kid you not. Wow. Well, yes. well, well yeah. it's, there weren't those sorts of restrictions. That's true. No, you're right. And, That's and true. it was a nudist colony magazine. Right, yeah. and this is these so are sort of the nudist style. magazines yep. that you hear Hawkeye talk about on MASH, that he's receiving his nudist to the month. Oh, yes. right, that's, magazine. That's exactly the mm-hmm. magazines that he's talking about. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about how they're all playing croquet, they're yes. playing tennis, they're trimming <laughs> that's, the hedge. Right. That's exactly what it was. And that's what you could ship through the mail at that time mm-hmm. um, without being prosecuted or persecuted. And so, um, Milton Luros, I did I say I dated his granddaughter? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's how I met him. And I would spend Sundays at his house, Saturdays sometimes having family dinners. And he would tell me about the beginnings of the industry and 
how he found it and how he got started and how it grew. Mm -hmm. And even at the time, I didn't realize how big of an influence he was in me because I didn't know the industry. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's funny. I was never a fan of porn. Mm -hmm. I was never a porn fan. I never watched it. I mean, I watched it, but I didn't. I had no idea who anybody was. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the only person that I knew in porn at, at the time when I was in high school or college or, or law school was probably John Stagliano mm -hmm. and Rocco Sofredi. Because they did this one series of movies that I really liked. Mm -hmm. But those were the only two guys. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, but going back to Milton Luros, he would tell me stories about how he started. And at one point in 1971, Time Magazine called him the richest or wealthiest man in porn. Cool. Now, there's a name that you may know. Mm -hmm. And that's Reuben Stern. That name sounds familiar. You know that name? I I know of the name, but I don't. You have I can't to, you, connect you it. You have to yeah. learn your porn history. <laughs> Reuben Stern bought out Milton Loros back in the early seventies, so he had been out of porn for a long time. Here's something that that you would recognize: the Karma Sutra. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Milton Loros brought the Karma Sutra to the United States. He was handcuffed and jailed getting off the plane <laughs> from LaGuardia Airport. And he fought that case in the United States Supreme Court, and I think it's called 35 Pictures. It's United States versus 35 Pictures, and he won. And because he won that case, we have the Karma Sutra. So he did a lot for mm -hmm. the industry, not only from a standpoint of establishing it here, but also mm -hmm. he was one of the earliest First Amendment fighters in the business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that broke new ground. So he moved from nudist colony magazines to um, regular Nudie Girl magazines. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he ever made it to hardcore. Mm -hmm. I talked to a gentleman a couple of weeks ago who makes the claim that he was the first one to ever shoot a hardcore picture mm -hmm. that was put into a magazine that was owned at that time by Ruben Sturman, mm -hmm. Continental Press, that he bought from Milton Moros. Mm -hmm. And Ruben Sturman was supposedly the first person who took the chance mm -hmm. of publishing a hardcore picture in a magazine. For commercial, I mean, people are taking hardcore pictures, but never for right. commercial, commercial distribution. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. mm -hmm. and that paved the way for movies such as Deep Throat mm -hmm. and Behind the Green Door, because now we're still talking about the early seventies. Right. So mm -hmm. that one act of publishing a hardcore picture mm -hmm. opened and paved the way for the rest of the industry. And that one one uh, relationship really. You know, it started a, a it pattern, or a, you know, started well, more open door for, door for you. But I didn't get into the industry for eight years. I, I, we, we ended up breaking up, and mm -hmm. then you know, it was interesting stories, but I didn't really think about getting into porn. Mm -hmm. And then what ended up happening was, I was working in the valley, and you know, when you work in the valley, it's it's inevitable that you're going right. to meet somebody in the industry. It's yeah. it's it's like swinging a cat. Right. You, you, you can't do that without hitting somebody who it's works true. in the porn industry. Exactly. So I ended up meeting people in the industry and then I started handling some cases and then the Free Speech Coalition invited me to come in and give a speech to its membership about workers' compensation issues. Mm -hmm. And this is right after, this is eight years ago, right after the Darren James incident. Mm -hmm. So they were concerned about, you know, worker safety mm -hmm. and work comp. And so they invited me in to speak to some of the company owners about what's their responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I had worked for and handled cases on the behalf of Warner Brothers mm -hmm. and Universal Studios and Fox. Mm -hmm. And I handled a lot of stuntman cases. Mm -hmm. So I was very familiar with how the mainstream industry treated its workers mm -hmm. and how what happens on set. And you know, ever since I got into the industry, I've been preaching the idea that porn stars are not independent companies. Mm -hmm. They're employees, mm -hmm. and mainstream treats them as employees, mm -hmm. and we have to treat them as employees, mm -hmm. and companies have to have workers' compensation, mm -hmm. and almost no one is, a, is an independent contractor in the state of California. Mm -hmm. I'm an independent contractor, accountants are independent contractors, plumbers are independent contractors. Literally, you have to, be, you have to go through some licensing, mm -hmm. and you have to bring your own tools or the person who's hiring you doesn't control your work. Right. Like if you hired me as an attorney, you don't sit behind me mm -hmm. and tell me which book to get and what to research next and then how to end the work for the day. Mm -hmm. You just say, I need you to help me on this case. Same thing with your accountant. You don't, you know, you say, do my taxes. Right. You don't tell them how to do the taxes. And that's the thing that really separates employees from independent contractors. Mm -hmm. When you have a, a girl or a guy come to set, you're telling them what to do in the scene. You're directing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The mere fact that 
the boss is called the director, mm-hmm. and that leads to control of the employment and control of the situation, which leads to them being an employee and not mm-hmm. an independent contractor. Mm-hmm. But that's been, you know, it's very difficult to get people in this industry to understand that one simple concept. Right. It's like, how can I have an employee for a day? Yes, right. you can have day employees. Have. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if you invite someone into your home or you hire somebody to come into your home and clean your house and they fall down the stairs and break their neck, you're not going to be able to go, oh, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. They were just a day employee. Right. Not my fault. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> she should have been looking where she's going. Mm-hmm. No. On every homeowner's policy, there's a rider. There's a worker's mm-hmm. compensation rider that if somebody that you hire into your house gets hurt, they cover it. Mm-hmm. We have these big production companies, but there are also a lot of really small production companies mm-hmm. when where it's, it's, it's one person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, who's, who's doing this, and they're not making the kind of money that the larger companies are making. You know, so, you know, what's the give and take, or what's the advice? Should they be treating there this is, the same way? There is no give and take. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's no give and take, because in the state of California, it's a felony not to have workers' compensation insurance. I'm sorry, I take that back. I think that was changed to misdemeanor. It's a misdemeanor not to have workers' compensation insurance. And if you have one employee or a hundred employees, mm-hmm. you have to cover them. And what people don't understand is that the workers' compensation insurance is not for the employee. Mm-hmm. It's for you. Mm-hmm. Okay? You're, people don't get insurance to cover other people. Mm-hmm. Insurance insures you. Mm-hmm. When you're driving your car and you have insurance, you have insurance. Why? For not you. Not to help mm-hmm. someone else if they run into you and get injured. Mm-hmm. You have insurance because you don't want to be personally sued. Right. You don't want to have to give up pay, your mm-hmm. salary, your bank accounts, your mm-hmm. goods to take care of someone else. When you have life insurance, you know, you're dead. It's not for you. It's to help the people that are around you. Mm-hmm. Okay? And with workers' compensation, what employers understand is it's not to ensure the health of employees. I mean, that's, liable that's the way. goal. Right. That's the goal. The idea is is that if somebody falls down on your set and they require any amount of surgery, Mm -hmm. you're looking at a case that's worth Mm $100,000. And in California, what people understand is you cannot, you can't BK that away. Right. You You can't can't, opt out of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You you can't go, well, you know, if they get injured, I'm just going to go bankrupt. Right. I'm going to bankrupt my company and Mm -hmm. I'll be fine. Because what the law basically says is that Anybody who is more than a 15% owner of that company is personally liable. And the way it works is is that if somebody gets injured on set and the production company doesn't have insurance, they can then put in a claim with a state unit called the Uninsured Employers Fund, Mm -hmm. which is all the insurance companies and everybody who buys workers' comp pays a little bit into this big fund, Mm -hmm. and then they pay the benefits to the injured worker. But then what they do is once the case is settled, now they say, okay, well, we paid $100,000 out on it. Now they come after you personally. Mm -hmm. So if you have a house, they put a lien on your house. If they have bank accounts, it's almost, dealing with the Uninsured Employers Fund is like dealing with the Franchise Tax Board. They will (laughs) haunt you and run you down. (laughs) They are not playing games. They will put levies on you. Mm -hmm. They will take your bank accounts. They will go into them. You'll show up. You'll have ten thousand dollars in your bank account one day. Gone. Oh it's them. They got it, and it's gone. So, and that's what people understand. And workers' compensation insurance is so cheap. Right. It's not expensive. So, how often do you have someone come into your office and know none of this? Not know that they have all the time a claim. Not know that they've the been time. wronged. Not know. I mean, I can only imagine <clears throat> me, even in in the work that I do or the work I I've never. You know, I mean, I haven't fully looked into everything that my employer, you know, is responsible for, but I can only imagine, especially in this industry, that people come in with complaints or with issues or with something, and, you know, you kind of open up the door behind how much they're owed or how much there's a problem. Or... I mean, one of the things I'm dealing with right now is not even workers' comp, it's, it's labor commissioner stuff. People in this industry don't like to pay on time. Okay. Mm-hmm. When somebody shows up on your set and it's same-day pay, that mm-hmm. means same-day pay. 
And if you don't pay them the same day, then what ends up happening is, is that you're now liable to that person. Let's say, let's say a girl shows up and does a boy-girl scene, mm -hmm. and her rate is $1,000 mm -hmm. okay, for that scene. You're supposed to write her a check that day. If she leaves and you haven't paid her, she now has a claim for late pay. And the penalty for late pay is $1,000 a day up to 30 days. Whatever wow. she was owed for that day. Wow. Nice. Yes, whatever she was owed for that day continues to accumulate. So if you don't pay her for 30 days, she can file a... $30,000. 31000 $31, Right, the original. <laughs> Your $1,000 plus $31,000. Nice. Or plus 30000 And what people don't realize is you're not going to win that argument in front of the labor commissioner. You are going to lose that every time. The mm -hmm. labor commissioner is very pro, pro-employee. Mm -hmm. And those are the penalties that they impose. And if you get a hearing, okay, mm -hmm. and what will happen is, is that even if you try to settle, you don't pay the girl. You pay the labor commissioner who pays the girl. So the labor commissioner knows that the case is resolved. So that $1,000 pay, for instance, if I had to take that case on, would I expect to get $31,000 from a production company? Absolutely no. not. <laughs> because you're going to get paid too. Mm. Well, no, no. It's, <laughs> no, it, it, it's not even that. I, I would not expect a, right. a company They're to be able to come up with $31,000. Right. But, but I could easily say, hey, you owe her $3,000 now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're going to pay her too, mm -hmm. and you're going to pay me one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's... You, you can have a $31,000 penalty, mm -hmm. or you can settle today for $3,000, mm -hmm. or $5,000. Mm -hmm. right. If you don't pay people on time, it's going to come back and really haunt the production companies. Yeah. Because it is something that is easy to get. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a small claims case. Mm -hmm. It's not a lawsuit. Right. It literally is a labor board case. Mm -hmm. And those go pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. 